Hello, friends, and happy Rare Diseases Day 2024. Um, I know that this is an extra added bonus session, um, so I know a lot of people may not be logging on, but I hope you guys have the opportunity to watch this sometime in the future, just because I think this information is really, really important, um, and I just feel really blessed to be able to share this with you guys um, for this community um, that we're raising awareness for. So let me jump in here and open my PowerPoint here. I'm going to share my screen with y'all. All right. And then we'll get rocking and rolling here to celebrate Rare Diseases Day. So um, this is a day that I think is so very important for so many reasons. Um, and I think it's important for all physicians to know about rare diseases, but I do think that it's really important as dermatologists um, that we do um, know about these and keep these always at the forefront of our minds because a lot of people go undiagnosed. Um, and that's really hard. A lot of families um, know there's something wrong with their child um, and they have a sense there's something wrong, but it just seems like they can't get the answers that they need. So it's really, again, quite a privilege and honor to, to work with kiddos with rare skin conditions. Um, and it means so much when you can help um, advocate for these kiddos um, as the physicians that are caring for them um, and just kind of be a partner on their team. I'll let you know that um, a lot of these families know a lot about these rare disorders because they've had to advocate for themselves so much. Um, so it is great to partner with them, partner with the parents, partner with the kids as they get older, um, because again, um, you're going to learn so much from them and hopefully they're going to learn so much from you because you guys will all know about these rare skin conditions because you're brilliant dermatologists and have been watching T4 all along in your training. So here we go. So some facts about rare diseases. Um, and let me move my little screen up here. Perfect. All right. So some facts about rare diseases are that there are 3 million people worldwide with rare diseases. So they're really not as rare as we might think. Um, they affect up to 3% of the population um, or 3.5 to 5.9% of the population. And then as we know, um, in, in dermatology, most of these conditions that are rare um, are genetic. So 72% of these rare disorders are genetic. Um, and again, when we look at the population, 3 million people are affected, 3.5% um, in any um, disorder that occurs in one in 2,000 people or less is considered a rare disease. So basically what, um, what are the biggest um, problems and issues that these people face um, when they're living with a rare disease? So basically there is lack of scientific knowledge. We know that lack of quality information of the disease, and then that can result in delay in diagnosis. And I do think, again, it's really important for us as dermatologists, especially pediatric dermatologists or dermatologists that see children, that when things just don't seem to be adding up um, or we have a constellation of different symptoms, um, it's really, really important to kind of keep your eyes and ears open. Um, and you may not on the first visit pick up on a difference or you know something that's a little bit unusual. Um, but as you see those patients over time, hopefully it will become more clear and, and conditions do evolve. So we do know that with a lot of these genetic skin conditions, they may not have symptoms or all the classic findings um, when they're infants, but those do develop over time, even though they're programmed to be there genetically from the very start of their lives. So we know that there is a need for appropriate quality health care. Um, we know that for these patients with rare conditions, there are so many inequalities, there's so many difficulties in accessing the treatments they need um, and the care that they need. And really, and with a lot of these conditions, there aren't treatments, there's management, um, and we can walk alongside our patients and helping them um, 
And, you know, the great thing is there are newer treatments coming out for all of these more rare conditions. And I'm just so thankful um, because, you know, I've always said that children with skin conditions they're and I learned this from my mentor, Dr. Siegfried, they're therapeutic orphans. Um, they don't have a lot to choose from. And this has partially been part of you know, the system, it's hard to enroll children in studies, there weren't incentives to do so um, for pharma, but now those things are changing. And I'm just so thankful to see a lot of these new medications rolling out um, that we can use for our patients. And that's only going to get more and better as time goes. Um, but we can't ever forget the heavy social and financial burdens on our patients, especially those with rare diseases. Um, the social part, you know, it's so stigmatized to be different. Um, and again, we're all trying to stand out and, and be famous in our own right on social media or, you know, to, to um, you know, just kind of have our own signature mark. But when you're actually born with something that gives you a signature mark or makes you different from everyone else, it really informs the development of children because, you know, a lot of people are older um, and they have their self-confidence, their self-esteem um, developed. But as a child who looks different, um, we know that there's an increased risk of bullying. There's an increased risk of being ostracized from groups. Um, and again, there's so many misunderstandings and people don't really know how to interact with people with differences sometimes, unfortunately. And that's part of the reason that I started Made a Masterpiece to help change that um, for the kids that we take care of um, and provide a community that supports the social, emotional, and spiritual aspects of living with a um, different skin condition that might stand out. Um, because again, their development is so affected by it just because of the fact that, you know, people stare at them constantly and, and to be stared at, um, you become self-conscious, um, and again, it really affects self-esteem um, and the desire for these children to really want to go out into public. So um, I think we always have to remember that. And then the financial burdens, a lot of times um, we don't see these because, you know, they're not talked about or we don't have time to discuss them and we kind of pass those off on other people. But I think we need to always realize that um, there are huge financial burdens, and some of these may prevent patients from being able to get to us regularly. They may no-show for appointments because sometimes they need special assistance getting to our clinics to see us. So just because a patient no-shows, um, especially those with rare conditions, don't always assume that they're being irresponsible um, because there are a lot of factors um, that prevent inequalities in the access to healthcare that, again, are very complex. And I think you know, it gives me hope that this younger generation, hopefully all of you guys that are watching are going to make differences in those inequalities um, and make, you know, healthcare more accessible to everyone. Um, and again, these rare conditions, they're broad, even within the dermatology space, there are so many different disorders. And we're learning about those disorders and able to group them better as we find out about their genetics and understand more about them. Um, but a lot of these conditions really have similar symptoms, um, but they can somewhat be hidden. And sometimes the patients don't realize um, that their symptoms go together. And then sometimes physicians don't really pick up on that. So again, just always be present um, when you're examining a patient, even if you don't think they have anything um, that's rare. Um, if you're not looking and you're not listening, you're never gonna pick those up. Um, and then again, research really does need to be international to ensure that experts, researchers, and clinicians are connected. Um, I'll tell you one of the most fun things that I've ever done. It's when I first moved down here and was on faculty at Baylor, moved down to Houston, working at Texas Children's, and I got an NIH grant, a conference grant, to bring together uh, people with AEC syndrome. So it's a type of ectodermal dysplasia, ankylobleferon, ectodermal dysplasias and clefting, AEC syndrome. And we had the biggest cohort um, of children with this condition ever assembled. And there was only 18. Um, but it really helps to bring them together. We were able to kind of define some phenotypic um, findings that weren't necessarily... Um, 
known before. Um, and then it was really great because we were able to bring together some of the most brilliant minds in research um, that could look at those conditions and we were able to obtain biopsies. And those biopsies are still being used in driving the science forward. Um, from that conference, Dr. Maronka Koster, um, who was at Baylor at the time and is now out in Colorado, um, she was able to use those biopsies and has learned a lot over time that I do think will translate um, into patient care um, in the future. So again, um, we're just so fortunate as physicians to be able to help patients in a very, very special and unique way, especially those with rare conditions. So don't under value um, what you can bring to patient care um, and to these these people that are sometimes suffering and in, in the shadows, if you will. And then it's also important to remember the biggest challenges are often unseen. So when you have a patient with a rare condition, um, just being seen and being heard by their healthcare providers is really so important. It's important for everyone, for each one of us. We all want to be seen and we all want to be heard. Um, but I think it's really important for this population um, to have the extra time and the special care um, that they need. So um, just really don't, when you know you're going to see a patient, don't be in a rush, take a deep breath before you go into the room and know that you need to just settle in um, and help this person that's before you who is really probably struggling if they have a rare condition. Um, and just, again, make the time and the space for them to share what they need to share um, and make the time and the space for your eyes to be open and your ears to be open um, and really, um, partner with these patients. And I promise you, um, you will get so much out of that and it will really um, reinvigorate you um, professionally as well. Um, and I know sometimes when we see patients with rare conditions, we may get excited um, and we may, you know, want to take pictures or um, really just kind of dig in in um, ways that are good for us professionally, um, but we always have to remember that there is a person um, behind that rare condition. There is a person behind that um, potential genetic change that they have, um, or you know, genetic mutation, if you will. Um, so again, don't forget about that. And people that have rare conditions, again, they're so sensitized from people staring at them. Um, and just their interactions in public, that it's really, really important um, that we really stand back. And if we want to take a picture, really think about why do you want to take a picture? Is it just so that you can, you know, brag about it later that you saw somebody with a rare condition? Um, or is it because you really want to use it in the future to help somebody learn and understand? Um, and again, it's probably best um, to make a connection on the first visit with this patient without taking any pictures. Um, it's better to invest that time that you might have taken, you know, might have spent taking pictures to really get to know this person as a person, know what they're struggling with. And then um, on future visits, after you have a therapeutic alliance um, with this patient and a good patient physician relationship, that might be the time to consider taking pictures and then just always let them know why you're taking the pictures. Um, and again, hopefully you have a good motivation or a good reason to be taking that picture. Um, so again, a lot of our patients are suffering and again, such a privilege to be able to help them and to help them be seen. So on the surface, what we see, so as dermatologists, luckily most of what we see is on the surface. It's a real, um, beautiful thing about dermatology is so much of what we see is on the surface. Um, but for our patients, so much of what we don't see is under the surface. And it can be even more important than what we do see on the surface. Because again, those social, emotional, spiritual struggles that um, our patients face um, cannot be undervalued. And so I will encourage anyone listening um, at some point in your career to get involved with the AAD's Camp Discovery um, program. Um, and it is a life-changing experience in so many ways. 
I think it can really shape you. Um, when you have these experiences early in your training, I started volunteering my first year of residency. Um, and I have been involved for many, many years. I've kind of stepped back um, and let the younger generation uh, take over in my place. But Camp Discovery, it's a week long um, experience. You can go as the medical staff, you can go as a counselor and be in the cabins with them. And there are different sites around the country. Um, they're all wonderful. They all have a unique personality, each camp um, and how they do things, but they are a great place for these kids to really kind of put down that invisible armor that they wear and really just be a kid. Um, and it's also a great place for you to meet these kids. And again, um, as the medical director of some of these camps um, in the past, and also as um, the AAD's camp chair um, for the national committee, um, we don't want to go in as physicians. We want to go in as friends. Um, so again, you're going to have scientific um, our minds are science-based as physicians, or at least they should be to some degree. Um, and you can't turn that off. Um, but, you know, when you go to camp, really just kind of turn down the volume on the science and turn up the volume on the heart, the heart strings kind of part of your, of you, um, so that you can see really what these kids go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that will help you be a better, a physician and a better healthcare provider if you just sit back and and kind of be a part of the whole camp experience with them. So again, definitely go. You'll see some of the most rare conditions that you may never see walk in your clinic's doors. But again, you're also going to learn about what's under the surface for these kids. And again, the Camp Discovery Program is great. It's supported by dermatologists. And again, as future dermatologists, I would encourage you to support um, Camp Discovery so that more kids can go to it. Um, it is fully, they, the AAD gives scholarships to these children and they don't have to pay for their time at camp or their flights there or transportation there. Um, so usually the applications each year open around... Um, January or February, they usually close about mid-April. Um, and this is the link to get online. Um, and they are currently open for this year. I will tell you, we are always looking for um, more people with XY chromosomes, um, just because we don't get a whole lot of um, males or, you know, applying. But certainly, if you have any interest, I would encourage you to go. Um, and I promise it will be an amazing, amazing experience. So if anybody ever has questions about camp, please, please always reach out to me. You can get a hold of me through Sages um, on our on our website through the the um, link for Tots to Teens as well. So on the surface, um, you may see a camper with vitiligo, and it causes these deep depigmented patches, as we know, we're learning so much more about vitiligo over time, that it is this inflammatory signal that's chasing those melanocytes out of the areas of deep pigmentation. They can have poliosis, so those white patches, um, when they affect the scalp, it also affects the hair. And we do know that if you have poliosis in an area of vitiligo, that the chance of getting repigmentation is less. So it's really important to look at the hairs in these depigmented patches um, when you're looking at patients. Um, and luckily, when I first put this talk together, we did not have the JAK inhibitors, the topical JAK inhibitors, the systemic JAK inhibitors. We just really had topical steroids, um, topical calcineurs inhibitors. And if you look at the literature, there are some, you know, handful of case reports that say it's helpful. But when you look at you know, any kind of significant number of people that had been using these, they don't seem to really help. Um, so topical steroids um, are great. Um, I don't jump to using intralesional steroids with kiddos just because I do think that you can um, use intralesional steroids to sometimes in a small area bring back pigmentation, but I don't do that because it's usually so um, diffuse and it's not like you just have one little patch. You usually have very symmetric patches. Um, 
but you know, I do like doing the topical steroids in combination with the topical calcineurin inhibitors. So again, I think that's a good way to kind of hit it hard with the topical steroids, but then to reduce the side effects to use your topical calcineurin inhibitors, because again, um, most people do have some type of repigmentation with the topical calcineurin inhibitors. It's just a little bit slower. Then certainly phototherapy is a great option still. Um, and, you know, basically phototherapy and laser, so an eczema laser. And then camouflaging makeup. So if a patient is interested in, you know, covering, certainly um, putting them in touch with people that can help with camouflaging makeups. Um, but some people don't want to cover and some people want to cover at certain times and not others. So they might want to cover for like, say, prom or a big dance, but they don't want to cover all the time because it's time consuming. Um, and some people like to cover all the time and some people like to cover never at all. Um, so again, and sometimes that's part of their journey and discovering um, how they want to be seen um, by the world as well. Um, but under the surface here, Curtis, he's a sweet, friendly young man. He's outgoing. He really is a bit of a ham still to this day. He is now off at college. Um, and I will tell you that he really let his personality shine at camp and he really wanted to get a picture um, with this pig when he was at camp just because of the fact that um, he's like, look, he's got spots like me. So again, so important when these kids don't feel alone um, and that they can see themselves <laughs> and other people. All right. So this is Hope. She was a beautiful young lady, brilliant. Um, by now she may have cured cancer. We know that's not true because there's no cure for cancer, but this young girl, um, I will tell you was off to do great things. Um, when I met her, um, in her adolescence, um, she, you know, we, there's diffuse pigment dilution, um, different genes play a role in this. Um, and the really important thing that really inhibits them or, you know, that makes life challenging for them is the pigment dilution that they get in their eyes um, that causes um, near vision issues. So a lot of people, you know, need special glasses. Um, if not, they will hold things very close to their face so they can read. Um, they'll have nystagmus, as you know, um, and many people are considered legally blind um, when they have albinism. And of course, it's really important to manage these kiddos with sun protection. Um, and also to refer them to ophthalmology um, for their vision issues. And then of course, so, so important to look at these kids um, head to toe and just get them in the habit of looking head to toe since there is an increased risk of skin cancers. Um, and I would also encourage um, you guys to study about albinism in the world. Um, in Africa, there is a founder effect and I've done quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of mission work um, in, in Kenya and Tanzania um, because this is more common there. And unfortunately there are, you know, the education is growing um, in this part of the world, but unfortunately um, they're shunned by society um, and they also have a reduced life expectancy just because they aren't as educated about needing sun protection. They also don't have access like we do here in the US. Um, so, so many of these people that are affected with albinism um, develop skin cancers um, that are very difficult for them to get treated. And a lot of them have a very shortened life expectancy um, because of these skin cancers. Um, and there was one week uh, where I went with a dermatology nurse, another pediatric dermatologist, and we removed nearly a hundred skin cancers and precancers um, in, in children with albinism there. So again, you can have a huge impact when you go to the mission field. Um, so again, always remember that there's great need, not just in our own backyards, but also in the world in general. And as a dermatologist, we have some really unique skills that, that can translate well on the mission field. So anyway, Hope was a quiet and inquisitive young lady, and she really opened up at camp. And again, uh, she wanted to be a physician, and I suspect at this point she already is. 
All right. So this is Luke. Luke is a dear friend. We su have supported him through the Camp Discovery Program, and he was just a speaker at our uh, most recent fundraiser for Made a Masterpiece. And he is an amazing young man now. Um, he is off at um, college at Mary, Mary Harden Baylor. He's studying marketing. Um, and it's just really been wonderful to see him just evolve as a human, um, but also to see him suffer so much with severe atopic dermatitis um, and having multiple food allergies, environmental allergies, asthma. And again, up until recently, really all we had was a allergen avoidance, emollients, topical steroids, topical calcineurin inhibitors, which is a huge deal when they came out when I was in training. Um, because it was the first thing that had come out in ex for eczema in years. And then certainly phototherapy. I think we can't forget about um, narrow band UVB, which can be prescribed for people for home panels. It's still a great treatment and can be very effective. Um, certainly the biologics that have come out um, now are amazing and wonderful and really changed the landscape in such a positive way for those affected by atopic dermatitis. Um, and because in the past, all we had was systemic immunosuppressants. I had patients on, you know, I'd prescribed so much methotrexate and cyclosporin and imuran um, as a young uh, pediatric dermatologist. Um, and so, again, it's so nice to have more options right now with the biologics, the JAK inhibitors. And then, again, we can't forget about the itch component. Luckily, a lot of these treatments that treat the underlying pathogenesis also help. Um, with being antipyretic, um, but it's really, really important um, to address this need for our patients with atopic dermatitis because it's really the symptom that gives them the most trouble. It's the symptom that gives the parents the most distress. Um, so again, always ask about pruritus and do what you can to help make sure that that is managed. But again, Luke is such a great kid, such a great young man. Um, and he has, you know, just really blossomed um, when he met others who understood how he felt. And this is Adriana. Uh, again, she just had a smile that lit up the room. Um, you can see here that she had alopecia areata, or what we would call um, not just totalis, but universalis. She had loss of hair all over her body. Um, and she, amazing, um, amazing. Um, but the great thing about her is she's really kind and caring, um, and just has that brilliant smile. I mean, who needs hair when you have a smile like that, honestly, but again, this has changed so much since the first time I made this, um, this PowerPoint presentation. So I usually always do start out with topical steroids. I think, you know, a lot of times alopecia areata is going to get better on its own, but we know that during that phase, when people are first losing their hair, it's really important to walk alongside them and to support them, to support the family as they watch their child's hair fall out. Um, and that is going to cause a lot of stress and anxiety for not just the patient who's undergoing it, but the family of a child who sees that um, and what implications that's going to have for their life. Um, but again, a lot of times I think the hair will regrow despite what we do. Um, but again, we have a lot more to offer now. A lot is still off label, but now we finally do have some on label treatments we can prescribe. So I usually start with topical steroids. I very rarely do intralesional steroids. I know we use intralesional steroids a lot more for alopecia areata than we do um, vitiligo, but you know it is not something that I jump to, especially if there are multiple patches. Um, and I think it's really traumatizing and we have a lot of better options for kids um, these days. Again, topical calcineurin inhibitors, much more effective in vitiligo, less so in um, alopecia areata. I really loved contact sensitization. I used that a fair bit. And um, I use diphenylcyclopropanone, DCPC. Um, some people do use squaric acid. And I do think this is still a great way to get hair to regrow um, if people are not really wanting to do anything more aggressive. Um, I do sensitize on a quarter size area in the clinic. And then I give a really low potency through a compounding pharmacy um, to put on once a week. Um, the biggest side effect really is um, alert, the allergic contact sensitization that they get. So you need to make sure that 
the strength is low enough um, that they don't really have symptoms that affect them too greatly, um, but also enough symptoms to kind of stimulate the immune system to be redirected from the hair follicles to the skin surface is how I think these work um, and leave the hair follicles alone so that the hair can regrow. Certainly the JAK inhibitors. And then again, you can think about wigs, you can think about tattooing. I do really encourage kids that are young not to get their eyebrows tattooed because they may not like it in the future. Um, but if you have an older you know, teen um, that's interested in doing that, I think it is something worth considering. Um, most kids don't like wigs um, and it's really hard to be fitted for a wig. Um, there is another, the topic spray, if they just have a few little spots of alopecia areata, the topic spray is kind of almost like silly string, but they're these little hair fibers. They come in great, um, many different colors and they're great to kind of just kind of camouflage the skin from being seen. Cause a lot of times, um, the hair will move and people will see the bald patch, but if they have kind of those hair fibers filling in, then it's something that isn't seen quite so, so easily. So just a little tips and tricks for LP Shariata. Houston um, was changed by camp. And unfortunately, Houston is now in heaven. Um, he was a great junior counselor. Um, and again, he benefited from camp in so many wonderful ways. Um, and I got to spend a fair bit of time with Houston one-on-one -on -one because he had fallen at camp and had a big skin flap open up um, over his nevus. Um, and so we had to clean it out and suture it up. Um, and he, just as much as camp changed his life, he changed my life for the better. Um, so again, oh, sorry. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Camp's a great place. Um, and again, it will change you for the rest of your life if you go in, um, and let it, but again, um, so certainly, um, huge congenital melanocytic nevi, um, especially when they have, um, satellitosis, um, have an increased risk of having all kinds of neurologic issues, seizures, spinal cord involvement. And then certainly we know melanomas can come not just in the skin, but also in the CNS. So, um, hard to follow these kiddos. Um, it's really important to have them, um, checking their skin, but we do know that they can get large areas, um, that grow rapidly, um, they can be melanoma, and sometimes you do have to do multiple biopsies on these kiddos um, if spots are changing. Um, but it's just really important to, you know, have them know their skin um, and then you to help them when they say that they've noticed a change um, and just, you know, really be able to examine them on a regular basis um, and emphasize that importance to them as well. So this is Jessica. She was another quiet young lady who became more comfortable in her own skin at camp. Um, so you can see here that she has ichthyosis. Um, and, you know, it's really hard living with this condition. You know, we know ichthys means fish scale. So these kiddos live um, with scale on their skin, kind of head to toe. Um, there's different subtypes, different genetic changes or mutations that lead to these, but something that um, tends to be pretty universal is the hyperpigmented scaling, the ectropion that they get, um, their skin, while it's thickened in some areas, tends to be more fragile. Um, it is also very prone to be dry um, and xerotic in addition to the scale. Um, and then we do know that overheating because of their hypohydrosis is also important for them to understand and know um, about. And if you're educating the families, just have them be aware of cooling techniques that are really important. Um, the ectodermal dysplasia community, the National Foundation for Ectodermal Dysplasia, while it's not an ichthyosis. Um, they do have some great information on their website with cooling techniques. Some kids um, will wear um, cooling vests. I do love the frog togs um, that you can wet and they um, 
go through a reaction where they chill. And that's great to wrap around these kiddos necks so that they can be outside and play um, and do sports. Um, but it's very important for them to be empowered to start to understand their body and to pull back when they need to um, and just advocate for themselves um, so that they can participate in as many um, things that they want to. Certainly bathing, um, and this is something that's really important. Um, bathing on a regular basis is important, but we have to understand that sometimes it will take these kiddos two, three hours to really bathe in a way that helps their skin. So we can't devalue how much time and energy they're putting into their skincare. Emollients, and again, the technology on emollients are getting better um, keratolytics, um, and it's a fine balance between keratolytics um, and emollients. Certainly, we know that retinoids um, can help oral systemic retinoids, but you can actually use topical retinoids in small amounts um, to help with the ectropion. Um, sometimes they need rewetting eye drops. I really like to encourage them to get preservative free because over time we don't want them to become sensitized. And then um, you know, I'll tell you that a lot of people, um, families, and I've learned this from families, um, a lot of times we tell them that they're not going to grow hair and not to remove that scale. Um, but I've had some mamas that are really diligent about brushing that scale on their kiddo's skin um, and they develop hair. Um, and it's something that they can give their child as a gift. Um, so again, I think if you have a motivated family member who wants to brush the scalp and remove that scale, I think we should encourage them and cheerlead them and not tell them that um, what they're doing is futile. Um, because I have been proven wrong by many uh, dedicated mama um, and got to you know, have the privilege of watching their kiddos grow hair as they got older. So again, we get to teach them, but we also get to learn from our patients as well. So this is a kiddo, Wade. Um, he, I met him at the Minnesota camp, actually, not the Texas camp. And he was amazing. Um, he was shy and quiet, but he really came out of his shell at camp. He made friends with this counselor who um, was applying to dermatology residency at the time. Um, and he really did make lifelong friends. And you can see the typical, you know, morphology, um, that you see on the facial features and structures of those with hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia, the most common type. Um, and again, the X-link carriers, the females don't usually express as much as the males, um, but the hypotrichosis, the conical teeth um, with hypodontia, perioral and periocular hyperpigmentation. Um, and they also, of course, which you know was better at the, the Minnesota camp, the hypohydrosis, um, which is pretty classic as well. Um, again, cooling techniques. This is a kind of little pearl is, you know, a lot of times when I see a kiddo and I've been involved with the NFED, which is an amazing organization. I was on their scientific advisory council um, for several years and got to go to family conferences. Um, and so got to see a lot of these kiddos. And one thing that's kind of universal, just because they can't sweat, um, they tend to lay on cool tile floors. Like these kids know, even before they're able to speak, that they're overheating. Um, and luckily febrile seizures um, are rare, but they can happen and fevers of unknown origin. Um, so again, um, these kids know they're smart. They're smart. So let's give them the credit they deserve. Um, it's really important to refer them for dental treatment. Um, and they can do so many dental procedures early on to help these kids. A lot of these kids get dentures very young. Um, and I was able to um, see the development of a genetic treatment over time um, that is really, truly changing the landscape for the people that have had this. So again, so exciting for uh, the future and what it holds for treatments for people that want them um, in these rare conditions. So again, so much hope for the future. So this sweet girl, she, Christina, she was more poised than me. And I guess, a, <laughs> I guess the majority of people are more poised than me. Um, but she wanted to be a professional dancer and actress. And I would not be surprised if she isn't, because this is again, um, an old, old picture, but she just had a presence about her and a grace that was 
Oh, amazing. Loved being around her. Another friend here who is a counselor. She lives in Corpus Christi um, and she's amazing. But um, epidermal nevus syndrome, we do have to be um, cognizant of the other CNSI skeletal and cardiovascular um, changes that they can have and refer appropriately. Um, when they, if they develop any symptoms, again, can treat with topical or oral retinoids with variable success. Um, I have tried to laser some of these more superficial um, epidermal nevi without much success. Um, but again, I'm hopeful that future treatments will be um, helpful for these kiddos who do want treatment. Um, so care type keratitis, ichthyosis, deafness, kid syndrome, also a very rare um, genodermatosis um, caused by mutations in Conexin 26. And we now know there's so many more Conexin um, conditions, Conexin-related conditions. Um, a lot of times these kiddos are blind and deaf. And we did have one um, patient at the Texas camp, and this was a life-changing experience for me as well. It wasn't this young woman, Monique, um, but it was another young girl that I have the privilege of being her pediatric dermatologist at Texas Children's for many years. And we got her to go to camp. Um, the AAD paid for um, somebody that knew sign language to be with her throughout the week and sign for her. Um, and then um, she was having her birthday at camp. Um, and all the cabins worked with um, the interpreter um, and we learned to sing happy birthday um, with sign language um, and we were able to sing it to her at camp. Um, yep. And that's a memory that's going to stick around until I am old and gray. Um, and again, these camps do such a good job uh, all of these camps. This is the camp that is in, I think this is um, Dr. Wiss's camp, Karen Wiss. Um, and it is up in the New England area. Um, but Monique, you can see the the smile she has on her face is priceless because they got her up in a harness. We had a little girl with a rare ichthyosis and confetti that came to the Texas camp as well. Um, and she um, had to go up she was in a wheelchair um, and had bad contractures, bad, bad contractures. Um, and they were able to put her in a sling and she was able to do the zip line. So again, they really make these camps barrier free for these kids in so many wonderful and unique ways. And then uh, junctional epidermal lysis bullosa, Jamie um, was always very happy to tell me he was one of the oldest kids surviving with junctional EB. Um, again, many years ago, and he would get into the lake. Um, this was again up in the Minnesota camp. So they have the lake there um, and would just get in with his bandages and then do dressing changes afterwards because he wanted to live as normally as he could at camp. And it was just really wonderful to see. You can see that he has the typical facial and perioral erosions um, and the extensive dressing changes that are needed. Um, Again, some of these kids just really suffer um, and their parents have to put them in a bath or do wound care that, you know, makes them cry. And that's hard on the family and the parents. So I think, you know, not only when we come, they come to see us as physicians, I think it's not only important to, you know, fully evaluate them and of course, give them the medical care that they need, because that's our primary responsibility, but don't you know, forget about the social, emotional, and spiritual aspects. Um, and this year, Jamie won the most fish caught award. Um, and he really didn't complain about his condition for the most part. He really was a great guy, a great guy. And then this was Kyle, another great guy. Um, he had EB with skin fragility um, and he didn't let it limit him from participating in camp. He came in with not very many erosions and he left with a lot more than he came with. Um, luckily, nowadays, um, there is a new FDA approved treatment um, for non-healing wounds that can happen. He did have a few. Um, and this is a great treatment um, that you know, I'm just so thankful again to have these things rolling out and companies to be investing in them for these people with rare conditions. Um, there have been people that have done bone marrow transplantation. It's considered experimental, if you will. 
Um, but again, Deborah is a great resource for these families. Refer them. They have great nurses. They have great wound care uh, resources. Um, and again, just remember um, to be there for these patients with rare conditions because this kid, wow, he was a strong kid and I learned a lot from him too. Recessive dystrophic EP, most of the time that, you know, the collagen type four uh, gene mutations, but others have been defined. Um, and this, you know, can have replacement therapy and they're looking at those. So again, so many great new, um, great new treatments on the horizon, but skin substitutes is what we used to use in non-healing wounds. Sometimes you can get excessive granulation tissue doing topical steroids around the wound edges um, and very much limiting uh, topical antibiotic use. Um, this is something, and again, the AAD, um, some of my colleagues in Pediderm that are part of, you know, moving the research forward that are involved in PEDRA, um, hats off to them really, because they are really changing the lives of these kiddos with the research they are doing and the treatments that are on the forefront because of their dedication. Um, and again, her condition, Miss Megan, she didn't let it stop her. She didn't let it define her. And I think, again, this is something that we need to remind our patients. They're not defined by their condition, um, but you know, they do have to take things into account, but um, at camp, they can really just shine. Um, so these little girls are no longer little girls. Um, this is Juliana and Amy, and they have xeroderma pigmentosa. Um, couldn't participate in a lot of the, the activities, um, but they did, you know, wear their UV protective garb. Um, and over time at Camp, um, Camp Frawl here in Texas, um, we were able to get a big cohort of these kids together, which was really nice. Camp for All invested in them. Um, and they really, they designed a whole indoor track. Um, Lindsay, um, child life specialist who goes to the Texas camp and used to work um, for the nonprofit. She's amazing and, and really made, you know, a backwards day where we did a lot of the things we would do during the day and the evening. Um, and just really, you know, help these kids feel as normal as possible, even though that they are rare. Um, so again, so many good ways for kids to come alive at camp. And then over time, camp has committed to doing the window tinting and the, the main areas and the cabins where these kids stay. Um, so again, they can really live a lot more like a kid when they're in these special environments. Um, and this is great. This is a young woman. This is her physician who defined the um, genetic uh, mutation in this condition, Sudazenthoma elasticum. Um, and this was her patient. Um, so they came out to camp together because she was really struggling with the changes on her neck. And it was a really eye opening experience for this young woman. Um, no uniformly effective treatment now, but hopefully in the future, um, that changes. And this is a dear, dear friend of mine who was um, a patient of mine. I first met her when I was at Texas Children's at Baylor. Um, and now she is one of my BFFs. Allie is amazing. She was really depressed before she came to camp, but she really gained confidence there now. I got to really see her come to life, see her meet the first person that she's ever met with ichthyosis in her life at camp. And they've been in touch since then. Um, and that was a young man who was a child at the time, and now he's a young man, and they've had video conferences, be, you know, since that time. And again, she's amazing. She's amazing. Um, and, you know, her condition name changed. It used to be called epidermolytic, you know, EHK, and now it's epidermolytic ichthyosis. So she's always like, I'm always rebranding. So she's great. Um, this is Stephanie. I've also known Stephanie since she was a child. Um, and she is amazing here and here with a young man who is now um, grown up. And I love seeing him all grown up too. He has a significant other um, with a kid kiddo in their lives. And Stephanie has two of her own. Um, but really, so, so good. 
so, so good because, you know, the campers and uh, the counselors that come with skin conditions can really connect. Um, and as a medical staff, it's really fun to be part of the talent show. Um, so again, camp is great. You should go. Another camper that came with LP Shariata, um, who had backed off treating her condition. Um, and I think that's important for us as physicians um, to treat when patients want treatment, but to also step back and support them um, when they don't want treatment um, and make that okay too, or give them a break as an adolescent. They may you know, not want to focus on it for a while because when they're not doing treatment, I've had so many patients tell me um, that when they're focused on doing treatment, um, they have to focus on their disease. And sometimes it's nice just not to think about it. So again, supporting our patients in their journey and their journey is gonna you know, have some ebbs and flows. And you may see two counselors here with ichthyosis um, and they were soon to be engaged. I don't know if they're still together. I hope they are, they're from Canada um, and really great people. And then here I am long time ago with very short hair um, at one of my first camps. Um, and this is Rachel. She became a child life specialist. She is now struggling with some conditions here, but um, she's a light. She wrote a blog post for our Made a Masterpiece resources so it can help others. And luckily there are people out there redefining epidermal lysis bullosa. Um, and I just love to see it um, and cheer them on. But Rachel is a dear friend um, and she taught me so, so much um, that really defined my career. Um, and lessons learned, you know what, y'all? I may save this for another day. I learned lots of lessons um, about people with common conditions, but also um, with very rare conditions. And I published that in the Practical Dermatology uh, Journal way back when, um, but we'll save this for another day. Um, but I hope that you've enjoyed, you know, going over, looking at what's on the skin, what's underneath the skin and these, these kiddos with rare um, genetic conditions, especially genodermatoses um, that we may never see in our career. Um, but if you do, again, treat their medical conditions or physical symptoms, but also don't forget about the social and emotional and spiritual aspects of physical of their, of their skin conditions. Um, and again, don't undervalue um, the importance of your care for these kiddos. So again, thanks for taking some time to celebrate Rare Diseases Day um, with me here at T4. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um, and I'm just going to look to see if there are any questions in there. Um, anybody that is participating with any questions? Um, I don't see so, so we're going to call it a night. Um, but again, thank you for taking the time to tune in to T4. I am looking forward to getting off to the Academy of Dermatology meeting, hopefully connecting with some of you there. Um, and we are taking a break that week. We won't, aren't gonna be doing T4. Again, we're doing it first and third, so we'll take a break. Um, and I will be out of town for spring break, but we may actually be adding in a pre-recorded bonus session um, that I'm working on. So, um, Again, look out for announcements from Sages, and again, reach out if you guys have any questions. It is my true joy and privilege to be able to teach um, and to share with you so that you can help future children with future children with skin conditions, rare skin conditions, love the skin they're in. All right, good night.